Hello and welcome to Cubs on Deck, a Chicago Cubs prospect podcast. I am one of your hosts. My name is Greg Huss, and today I'm joined with a new broadcaster co-host. I'm joined with Brendan King, one of the voices of the South Bend Cubs. Brendan, how is it going, man? Great. Thanks for having me, man. This is great. I always love the product that you guys put out, and as always, honored to hop on. So it's, uh, you know, we're talking here on March 10th, and... As of less than a month from now, we're going to be playing baseball. So can't wait, dude. That just gets me so so excited, dude. I'm I'm I can't wait for it. I know we did the preview episode of the Iowa Cubs season um, last week on last week's show with Alex Cohen. This week we're covering the Tennessee Smokies. Uh, you are obviously the voice of the South Bend Cubs, but uh, you've had your eye on a lot of these these guys that are likely going to be in Tennessee. And so I thought it'd be good to have you on the show here to give your expertise on some of the players you saw last year in South Bend. Um, but man, I, I, yeah, we, we had you on the podcast, I think pretty early on, uh, when me and Jimmy were doing the growing Cubs show. Um, and I, I think you were one of mm-hmm. our, one of our first, I, I think you might've been our very first broadcaster guest on the show potentially. I don't know, but, uh, excited wow. to have you back. I mean, hang, hang up the banner, H- hang up the banner. That's, that's, <laughs> that's a huge honor. Hey, that was just a regular season trophy. Now you're getting a postseason sh- trophy that's by what? being on Cubs <laughs> on deck. So <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're going to get into, uh, honestly, we're going to follow the same exact format, uh, for listeners out there, the same exact format that we followed with the Iowa Cubs breakdown season preview. Uh, but before that, I, I want to kind of ask Brendan here, I want to ask you about last year's South Bend team, because it was, it was a joy to watch that team as a fan. And I'm curious about from your perspective, some of your favorite memory or memories, uh, from that South Bend team. And some of these guys we're going to be talking about today. Man, Greg, there were so many, and the easy answer and the number one answer, obviously, is winning another Midwest League title. But for some reason, uh, you know, if the third time is ever the charm, we need to do it at home the next time that we win a Midwest League title. Obviously, we did it in Clinton in 2019 and then in Lake County this past year. But, yeah, I mean, I'm really lucky that my first year in South Bend, it was 2018. You know, I was 23 at the time. I'm 28 now, um, and, and we got two Midwest League titles. But I, I think what was special mm-hmm. about this team this year is they just always had a bit of a flair for the dramatic. Not to say the 2019 team didn't, but the 2019 team just kind of breezed through people. There was, not, <laughs> there was not a lot of extra effort, and I mean that in a good way, as to they just whooped people. And again, that's not to say this 2022 team didn't do that, but they just had a flair for the dramatic, man. Like when the bright lights turned on, they just went to work. There was some sort of clutch gene in these guys. And, uh, you know, speaking this time of year around March Madness, there's no better month with clutch genes. But all season long, you know, the championship. But I think what was really cool was, you know, we went nine and one on the games that were on Marquee Sports Network. So everybody watching at home. And from afar, really got a taste of what the future of the Cubs was. And, you know, all the walk-offs, you you think about a Matt Mervis walk-off bomb during his time in South Bend, Owen Casey's walk-off slam just as he turned 20. Uh, You know, Pablo Allendo on marquee beat the Peoria Chiefs on a walk-off bomb. Um, So, yeah, I mean, I, I think if anything comes to mind about that team, Greg, it was just... They had a sense for the moment, and they yeah. usually, most of the time, they lived up to it, and and that was really fun. Yeah, flair for the dramatic is right. I think that Alex Cohen led off last episode by making the uh, this is March comment, the John Roth scene, uh, this is March, right. but it, it, right. it pertains to, to spring training too. Um, we, I promise we will get into previewing these Tennessee Smokies, but I might've gotten a little bit ahead of myself. I I think that it's probably worthwhile. I didn't do this with Alex last week. Um, you mentioned the marquee games last year. Um, so fans got a little perspective on, on seeing you on their television, television sets, in addition to some minor league baseball, um, MILB TV, Mm -hmm. but you want to give just a, a brief rundown, a little background about yourself. So the listeners out there know, know what you're about, I guess. Yeah. I mean. Like I said, I've been in South Bend since 2018 and I've had a chance to work with some really talented people. You know, Chris Hagstrom is as um, successful of a executive producer as I've ever worked with. He's 
just got a compassion for the people he works with and a drive to succeed. And it's been really cool to be a part of that. And then, you know, being with Max Toma last year and then now this year, you know, Max is a really talented dude who is going to do awesome things in whatever he chooses to do um, because he's, you know, he is just so um, multi platform slash sport talented. Uh, so I think Max is going to do massive things, but you know, for me, you know, Greg grown up in the South Chicago suburbs. I'm from Mokina, Illinois, which is right by Orland park for people to get a sense of the South side. Um, so it's, you know, it's about a 45 minute drive downtown, but you know, that's the key word of a South sider, but I was never a South sider when it came to fandom. You know, I, I grew up a Cubs fan. First game at Wrigley was when I was two, went with my grandma and my dad. We still have the ticket stub. And, you know, from that point on, it was just a love affair that that just developed for the Cubs. And there were a lot of tough years there, obviously. You know that. You know, we're right around the same age. So, yeah, there, yeah, there were some tough times. But, you know, in 2003, the run, you know, 07, 08. And then, you know, when we when you and I were getting towards our college years and whatnot, we, you know, we kind of – we got what we've been waiting for and that was a world series title well you know my my dream my entire life was to it is to become the play-by-play guy for the chicago cubs and you know at first that really felt like a dream but now getting to call games within the organization man it's it to even be anywhere close to that goal is is monstrous and you know the people that have helped along the way you know pat hughes has become just such an amazing mentor. Uh, Boog Shambi's the man. Len Casper was super helpful when he was with the Cubs during my time in the org. So, you know, it's it's like one of those things where I'm still a massive Cubs fan, but that's like one part of life. And then the other part is getting to show up at the ballpark every day and interact with the future stars that you're going to see at Wrigley. So, you know, th- there's still the little kid Cubs fan in me for sure. But, um, you know, Wrigley's a special place. South Bend's a special place. The organization's special. And I, I, I just have fun every day, man. It's like uh, COVID really didn't teach me per se, but it really like opened, I think, a lot of people's eyes to just enjoy the little things and not take stuff for granted. And, you know, that's kind of how I was raised where, you know, appreciate everything you got. And you know, I always have, but especially since COVID, um, it's been like, man, I, I still get to do this on an everyday basis. And it's a lot of fun. I I don't know that I've ever asked you this, but I know I was in college. I was it was my junior year of college when the Cubs won the World Series in 2016. Where where were you when when the Cubs won the World Series? Yeah, I so I was a senior at Butler. Uh, so I didn't I didn't realize you were a year younger actually. But yeah, yeah I was. Uh, I, you know what? I was, uh, I actually got to be a college kid because <laughs> I, you know, I did a lot of broadcasting in, in school and, you know, a lot, some of that broadcasting took away from being social, but that particular night, I, <laughs> this is actually a great story. I was in college and in Greek life, I'm not sure if you've ever heard of lip syncs, um, a no. sorority will throw like, yeah, sorority will throw like their philanthropy week and a lip sync is where basically 10 or 12 guys from every fraternity goes and does like a choreographed dance to music outside the sorority and you compete and you, and like, if you win, you, you win, you win money. And then that money goes towards like our philanthropy. Um, so it, it ends up helping a better cause. But anyway, I had, I was doing, <laughs> I was doing a lip sync that week for a sorority with you know 10 guys and we had lip sync practice that night but i was like hey we need to have lip sync practice if this is going to happen we need to have this indoors and somewhere with a tv so i <laughs> brought my tv into our fraternity basement hooked it up put on the game seven of the world series i was like we are practicing until the third inning and then i'm leaving so you know i here i am probably looking like an idiot because my eyes are on the tv Well, it comes to be a third inning. I was like, see ya. And then my friends were already at Brothers Bar and Grill, which is a popular spot here in Indy, and got there, watched the rest of the night, and then, you know, the W happens, and and the party starts. So, yeah, it was cool. That's 
That's incredible. Well, did you nail the lip sync after the fact, or did you did you blow it because you were too busy watching the Cubs win the World Series? Uh, I'm I'm just not a good dancer, but I like doing them because <laughs> um, I I liked doing them because it was like an instant invite to that sorority's formal. If they saw you doing yeah. a lip sync, they'd be like, "Oh, this guy's fun. I'm gonna ask him the formal." I was like, "Oh, okay, great." <laughs> so, uh, no, I I don't think the dancing ended up being very good, but. If it, it, it meant I got to go to that sorority formal and the Cubs won the World Series, so I was cool with it. That's a that's a win in my book. All right, man. Uh, let's go ahead and get into the meat of this episode here because we got plenty of players to talk about. I mean, the I guess I did the same thing with this last episode about Triple A. Um, I'll do the same thing here with Double A. Is that we're sitting here in early March. We do not know what the rosters are. You're a broadcaster. You work with the South Bend Cubs. But you also do not know, like, we, we just don't know what the minor league rosters will look like. We don't know what the assignments are going to be. Right. So I pref- I'm, I'm very careful about prefacing these episodes by saying all of these players we're talking about today, it, they very well could be assigned up to Iowa. They very well could be assigned back to you in South Bend. Um, but I, I really want to point that out because we're going to dig, dig deep into some of these players. And I don't want fans to think, oh, like for sure, uh, Ryan Jensen's going to be assigned to Double A. He may, he may not be. He may be up in up in Triple A. But uh, there's a mm-hmm. lot of really, really talented players that are going to be likely on this Tennessee roster. And I want to start off, just like I did with last episode, with the starting pitchers, and that seems wildly appropriate for this Tennessee Smokies roster because the rotation might be one of the nastiest I've seen in my years covering the minor league system for the Cubs. Uh, you're looking at six guys that could potentially be in Double A Tennessee um, to start off in the rotation. I don't know the the teams typically go in the five man rotation. But there's six starting pitchers there. I'll run through this real quick and then probably hit on a, a few of them individually with you, Brendan. Uh, we're looking at Jordan Wicks, Ryan Jensen, Ben Brown, DJ Hers, Luis Devers, and Daniel Palencia. Which I I don't know, man. I, I'm not even going to kick it to one guy in particular here. Have you ever seen a rotation that looks that good come opening day in the minor leagues? Well, first, absolutely not. And secondly, <laughs> that's just dumb, the, those names together. <laughs> and I have not even – I've never seen Ben Brown pitch live. And actually, I'm leaving for spring training tomorrow. I'm going to spend a few days in AZ, which should be cool. But I, I've never seen Ben Brown pitch. I met him at Cubs convention. So it's kind of – Kind of the opposite. Usually it's you see a guy pitch first and then you meet him, but I've actually met him, but I've never seen him pitch. So that's a little unique. But, you know, he's the only one really I have not seen in there. I saw a little bit of Ryan Jensen when he was in South Bend. I was doing a couple games in 2021 at the time, and a couple of the games I did Ryan Jensen pitch. And the name that came to mind for Ryan Jensen, Greg, I think he is a young, for a bit of a throwback Cubs name here, he is a young Rich Harden. I think his delivery is very comparable to Rich Harden. I think he's just about the exact same size. And he throws sort of the same type of stuff where Rich Harden, he was never jumping off the page as this like athletic freak, but man, he could shove and he could really, really keep you off balance with a good fastball, a pretty solid change up and a pretty wicked breaking ball. So uh, Rich Harden was the name that came to mind for Ryan Jensen right away. But, you know, the other guys in there too, Greg, Luis Devers and Daniel Palencia, you know, they're towards that bottom of the rotation, you would think, in Tennessee if they wind up there. If Luis Devers and Daniel Palencia are either one of your five slash six or have got a piggyback out of a bullpen, dude, that's lethal. Because the same thing happened last year. Luis Devers arrived in South Bend after being named the minor league player of the month or pitcher of the month for April in Myrtle Beach. And after being the pitcher of the month at low A, he couldn't even crack a high A rotation. That's how deep it was. So he might be putting yeah. himself in that same realm where he's got to start in a bullpen. But he performed well there a year ago, and then he got his shot in the rotation, and he didn't look back. But you know the guy that, that's after him on the list we're looking at, Danny P, Danny Palencia, man. You think about growth, you think about a guy that you root for because he's not only talented as hell, but he is just such a good dude off the field. And you saw the kind of exponential rise that Daniel Palencia made last year where 
I remember his first start that he had was in Fort Wayne. It was on Easter Sunday, and it was really cold. It was one of those days in the Midwest. You would get this. It was one of those days in the Midwest where it looks gorgeous. The sun's out, nothing but blue skies, but it is freezing. Just <laughs> frigid. Way too and Daniel Palencia had to pitch. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it, it was just gross out. Well, just one of those days. But he had to pitch, and I, I don't think he made it out of the second inning, Greg. I think he walked four pitch count. He was pretty. Uh, he was on a pretty strict pitch count at that time, which I understand. But you're like, man, like you you can see the stuff. But you just wonder if this guy could put it together, because if he can, watch out. And then he had a start in Beloit. It was right around the fourth of July. I can't remember the exact day, but five scoreless, like eight Ks, just unfair. Uh, you know th- this. This guy, Greg, like Max and I talked about this last year. Th- this guy was throwing 94 mile an hour sliders. Yeah. 94 mile an hour sliders. Uh, disgusting. To, uh, and we, it, here's the thing it, it, it might not even be a slider. That, that's, <laughs> nobody knows what it is. Nobody, it, it might be a yeah. cutter, it might be a slider. I have no idea what it is. So, it, it, you know, if, if technically, and I use this with very big quotation marks, if he's the last guy in that, Tennessee rotation, I feel really bad for Southern League hitters. I feel really bad for him. Yeah, and, and the thing is, too, is that if you're looking at, at this six-man rotation that I've thrown out here, um, you, you're going one of one of two ways, right, is that either there's a six-man rotation in AA that is this deep that other lineups have to contend with, or the Cubs say, you know what, we don't want all six guys up in AA. Somebody's going to get assigned to South Bend, maybe, or we see Ryan Jensen up in AAA. But more than likely, we see somebody stick around back in in South Bend potentially. And with that, you have mm-hmm. Daniel Palencia carving up South Bend again. You know, and it's like that is I, yeah. when I look at these names, especially you 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 kind of dug into Luis Devers and Daniel Palencia. the the piggyback The piggyback route is something that the Cubs kind of dove into a little bit more last year than in years past, and those two guys could potentially pair so well as a piggyback tandem where you're, you've are you got Luis Devers, which is a very, like, pitchability-type guy. He's got the really, really nasty mm-hmm. changeup, um, and he just – he he commands the mound super well, right, where he just – he he works on his time. He's got the very deliveries, the a very different style than Daniel Palencia, who could follow him in a piggyback style. And Daniel Palencia is out there pumping 103 with the fastball, pumping 94 with the cutter, slider, slutter, curveball, whatever you, whatever the heck you want to call it. Um, <laughs> and it just has the nasty stuff. Yeah. It's like that tandem could be something super special when I'm looking at these this list of names. I'm with you, man. It, it It's just the Cubs have done a spectacular job developing that section of pitching in the organization. And I'm really glad, Greg, that finally, and, and this is not the Cubs' fault. This is this is a media thing. We can finally put to rest people saying that the Cubs can't develop pitching because th- that narrative is put to bed completely to me. I, I thought that was a pretty lazy media narrative. And it, it, people were still mm-hmm. saying it last year, Greg. I, I remember yeah. watching you know, MLB Network. People were still saying that last year. It's a really lazy take in my mind, because all you have to yeah. do, if you're if you're an MLB writer, dude, all, all you have to do is Google, go to Google, and and type in top thirty Chicago Cubs prospects, and, and then read the bios on the top pitchers. And if you still don't believe it, get in the car, drive an hour and a half to South Bend, and come watch Jordan Wicks, come watch DJ Harris, come watch Luis Devers. Uh, I I just thought it, it it turned into a huge lazy take, but you know that's it, uh, sometimes you got to prove stuff. This isn't even looking at a guy like I mean, there, there's other. It's I think you nailed it right. Where um, more than just the top end of prospects in the system, the Cubs have done a phenomenal job of like this middle this middle ground of prospects, like the the guys ranked uh and like typically like 10 to 40 like that's a big range right but like that yeah. 10 to 40 yeah. range has really improved right where like a guy ranked 30 now is could potentially be like a top 10 to 15 guy on a different on a different team's list 
And like they've just gotten really good at the Luis Devers and the Daniel Palencias and the Porter Hodges of the world, where those guys yeah. have really climbed up lists because they the, the Cubs development staff is honed in on particular skills, right? Whether it's that sweeper slider with Porter Hodge that is stupid good. We're not gonna dig too deep into him, but like or just the way that DJ Hers pitches, the, the the new pitches that Jordan Wicks. We haven't even really dug dug into Wicks and, and Hers yet. And those those are two guys that I thought Jordan Wicks was simply incredible last year. I know that the stats, if you look at the season long stats, they're not they don't completely blow you away. But when you go back and watch his starts from a year ago, he was tremendous. Yeah. So you and I hung out in the booth together in Peoria last year. And I think Correct mm-hmm. me if I'm wrong, but it was for jo- it was for Jordan Wicks's last Midwest League start. Am I right? It was, yeah. It was it was that start, and I think he sh- it was it was what five shutout in it was it was probably his best start of the entire year yes. that he had uh, over in Peoria. And then yeah, he I think both he and DJ ended up getting called up right around the same time, um, right around that series. And yeah. I, I when we had we had Jordan Wicks on the show earlier this off season. And I specifically pointed out that outing to Jordan. And I was like, hey, like, what what was the deal with that out? Like, how did you feel coming off of that outing? Like, you really had your stuff working. And I, I mentioned to him specifically that it felt like he reincorporated that really nasty changeup he has. And after working all season long to work on his other pitches, it all seemed to, like, fall together to a certain degree. And he all but confirmed that, that he just he felt really good and he felt like he was a complete pitcher at that point in the season. Yeah, so I, I'm glad you conferred it because I couldn't remember if we were together for Wixie or hers, but it, it was Wix. Now you know now it's all coming back. But five shutout innings, he struck out ten that day, Greg. I mean that was that that was a first round pick. There, there are just some games where you do for these top dudes. And, and, you know, a good example last year, Lansing came in the South Bend super late. They Lansing was already out of it, um, but they still played well. And Max Muncie, the the other Max Muncie, the you know the the A's Max Muncie, I'm talking the shortstop, uh, sh- showed up and just and just played like a stud. I mean, there there are just sometimes you know, and that start for Wicks was just a this is what you know start. Like it, it was surgical the way he threw mm-hmm. that day. And then you're right that him and DJ got called up on the same day. So, you know, looking back to the championship run, South Bend got really lucky because we lost Wicks and Hers on the same day. And then on the next day, we got Devers and Hotch. Not too bad. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. As much as, it's, as much as it sucks losing Wixie and Hersey, you bring in Devi and you bring in P. Hotch. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's a big reason of why the championship run was possible, but yeah, man, I, 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 I think when people throw around the name for Jay Wicks, I think when people throw around John Lester, it, it's, it's perfectly fitting. Uh, the guy's a gamer, nasty change up, um, zinging fastball, man. And, you know, Wixie, the, he throws that slide, he throws those two types of sliders and, you know, John Lester's pitch was the cutter. So maybe that's where they differ a little bit that, you know, and what's the difference at the end of the day between a cutter and a slider? You can, you know, still, but it, he's got the two types of sliders and that, that means a guy, you know, six foot three, 220 coming at you over the top, massive, massive dude, strong. And he's got four different pitches and two of them are breaking balls. Good luck, Greg. I mean, that's, yeah, he's going to be something. Yeah, I mean, I I look at this rotation, this potential rotation, and you got Ryan Jensen and Ben Brown that we already talked about that are both 40-man roster guys. Jordan Wicks is still, to me, the opening day starter for this Tennessee roster. Um, He just has that mentality, right? He has that gamer attitude that, like, he's your opening day starter, just the same as he's your game one starter in a playoff series, just the same as you want him in game seven of a playoff series. Uh, he's that guy for this organization and for this team in Tennessee. I want to hit on one more guy before we move on from the starting rotation that we can just go on and on and on about. Uh, DJ Hers is a little bit become a forgotten man over this offseason. Uh, we saw him absolutely dominate again in South Bend with you guys last year. He did get the call up right around the same time as Jordan Wicks up to Tennessee, and then he really, really struggled uh, with command and control. He was walking just a ton of dudes. 
Um, but this year he's entering the season with a new slider. I think that's going to be really huge from him for, uh, from him moving forward. And I, I don't think it's right that he's become so forgotten over this offseason. He was still the Cubs minor league pitcher of the year uh, a couple of years ago. He was still a guy that really performed well at the lower levels of the minors. And he's still a really young guy. I want to get your take on DJ Hers, um, both about his, because you've kind of seen firsthand his mentality and that, again, bulldog mentality that he has, but also mm -hmm. kind of who he is as a pitcher and what we can kind of expect from him in Tennessee this year. I love DJ. I love DJ. He's he's got that gamer type feel. You kind of you toss around the name, you know, the phrase bulldog. Yeah, the, the guy's just a competitor on the mound, and the the way he comes at you off that first base out of the rubber, and sort of that funky delivery, almost sidearm. I don't want to be a lefty stepping up to the plate against DJ Hers. Do you? Absolutely not. <laughs> <I've>, <laughs> it is it is unfair at times. Lefty lefty matchups and like you know he. It, I couldn't imagine being a hitter, and I'm a lefty, and this guy's working off the very first base out of the rubber. You know, how do I even pick up this dude? And then DJ throws something with like, you know, 25 inches of movement, way outside. It winds up in the right-handed batter's box, and this guy's going fishing at the plate. I, I can't even tell you how many times I saw that last year, or how many times we saw that last year. It it was just one after another, and, and pair that with a really good heater. And like you said, he, you know, he's only, I believe he turned 22 now. So the fact that DJ is only 20, 22, or the fact that DJ is only 22, but that's the blessing and the curse of a deep system, Greg. It, you know this as well as anybody, that when, when you're this good, and we have just gone through a six-man rotation, find me a weak link in there, right? Uh, that, that's the blessing and the curse, that when you have, when you have a system this talented, and specifically on the mound, naturally there's just going to be some guys that kind of get lost in the sauce. But it's up to them to go out there and remind you of why they made so much noise before. And maybe DJ's that type of guy because he did struggle a little bit when he got to double A. But I would have rather had DJ go do that in the second half of the season last year, kind of learn and pick up little tidbits, and now come back here in a fresh campaign who's going to be stronger, he's going to be bigger, and take what he learned last year and then apply it here in April. I would much rather have had that than him stay in South Bend all of last year and then get to Tennessee this year and have to learn that on the fly. You know, really, there, there's yeah. almost no pressure at times for DJ last year when he got to Tennessee because yeah. everybody knew what he can do, but, you know, go, go learn. And if if some things fail, it's okay. But go learn what you need to and then come back next year and dominate. Dude, I, I think you absolutely nailed it. The mindset of of a guy, I mean, all players um, are this way, but I mean, most players are this way, but especially especially DJ, where I can't even imagine the, the determination that he had this offseason to learn from his experiences back in, in Tennessee last year. Um, I, think, I think it's perfect. I'm really excited to see him take the mound again in 2023 as a part of the Tennessee uh, rotation. And uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, I think we could go on and on about these starting pitchers because uh, <laughs> Alex, Alex wanted to go, go into to these guys on the, on the mound a little bit last episode, but I was like, stay in your lane here a little bit, buddy. You, you got, you got Iowa. So uh, yeah, we, we could keep going. <laughs> but I think that I, I, I want to lean into the bullpen now because we talked about this rota rotation, but the talent doesn't stop there for the Tennessee uh, uh, pitchers because we're going to get into the bullpen here with guys like Zach Lee and Jake Reindel, which I think those two guys are legitimate back end of the bullpen type guys. Uh, Bailey Horn is back there. We'll go down some more names here, but uh, you saw Zach Lee last year. Um, I, I pretty solidly feel that Zach Lee is the second best relief prospect in the Cubs system right now behind Jeremiah Estrada, who we've already seen in the big league. So you, if you're ruling out Jeremiah Estrada because he's already seen Chicago, then Zach Lee is your guy in terms of a pure relief prospect um, and the tops in the system. He's so good. <laughs> he is so good. And you know, scouts really gush over this guy. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, he was a day three draft pick. I'm going to look it up. I'm going to look it up. But I'm typing while I talk. But 
Uh, yeah, six. He was a sixteenth round pick. Yeah, sixteen. And he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't <laughs> that, really very. Stupid. He was at Texas State, and he didn't put up good numbers really at Texas State. I, I think it was Texas State. Um, but it's one of those things that Cub scouts can find these guys. I, well, we can talk a little bit about Riley Martin here too, because Riley Martin was another guy that the scouts just went and found. Uh, Riley Martin was a guy, a yeah. D two pitcher uh, at a Quincy University. Zach Lee was a guy a little bit more prominent of a, of a baseball school down in Texas or Texas State, but um, really guys that don't jump off the page. You're able to get Zach Lee in the 16th round, get him into the pitch lab, and turn him into this where he's got a really a really good fastball in the mid-90s. He's got arguably the best slider in the system, although Jake Rindle might actually have him beat on that. Uh, but that sweeper slider is hmm. taken over, man, and Zach Lee's a prime example. Zach Lee's a prime example. Um, Jake Rindle is a prime example. I, you know what, Greg? I actually ended up seeing more of Rindle as opposed to Lee myself because uh, there were a couple road trips I didn't go on last year where Zach really did a bulk of his work in a South Bend uniform. So Max can probably give you a better answer than me if we're being honest on like what exactly he thinks Zach Lee can be. I, I think I think you know the ceiling is is the roof here for for Zach Lee, but you know Max saw a lot more of him than I did, but, you know, Jake Rindle, what what he did to end last year, because remember, he actually came up to South Bend pretty early, pitched in one game, got hurt, and left. Uh, it was like a ghost passed through Four Winds Field, honestly, mm -hmm. because we took his picture. We were like, hey, you know, like, when's he going to get into a game? Well, he got into a game on the road, got hurt, and then he was gone. Like, he went back to Arizona. And then, you know, we get back home and people are asking, oh, yeah, you know what? I'd love to see Rindle pitch. Where is he? I was like, well, he's he's not here. And then they're like, well, when's he getting back? I, like, I have no idea. And then he ends up getting back at the perfect time and becomes one of the crucial parts of the bullpen towards the back end of that championship run. I mean, he threw game one. Yeah, he threw game, in, game one of the division series against Cedar Rapids. Check out the side. Ma made three guys look absolutely dumb. Just complete, and it came on the sweeper slider that you just alluded to, where he struck out every single guy. Strike out, strike out, strike out. Later, uh, we're up one nothing. It, it was, uh, you know, what? I, I was putting together my end of season baseball reel, Greg, and I included that half inning in there because it was just super exciting and you know, good crowd noise, and uh, you know, obviously it's a su successful inning for the team. But I was like, oh, you know, I wonder if I can find an inning to kind of just put at the end of this reel to kind of close it out nice and. The, the half inning, it took five minutes and 45 seconds for him to strike out the side in game one of a division series game. It's like, thanks, thanks Jake. <laughs> that works out perfect for the real. So uh, he, he he's he's efficient. He's effective. And he's probably got the best hair in the system, you know, for what that for what's that that is worth. If, but uh, if you were yeah, going to bring it up, he's I cool, believe. dude. Yeah, I mean, that guy's got the flow and locks. But uh, I mean, even more impressive than the hair is his stuff. I mean, that's that slider is disgusting. And the angle he comes at, too, kind of that sidearm look, kind of similar to DJ Hers, where, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a right on right guy facing Jake Rindle and just looking stupid on swinging and missing on one of those sliders. Yeah. And, and I, I want to trans, we, we got those like real back end type guys in Lee and Rindle. Um, Bailey Horn is another guy that we might see him in Iowa. He might be down, down in Tennessee to start off the year, but he, he, uh, appeared in the Arizona fall league last year. Uh, he really started to hit his mark as the season wore on uh, a year ago in 2022. He was the acquisition in the, uh, Ryan Tapera trade with the White Sox back a couple of years ago. Uh, Bailey Horn's a lefty. And I, I, I think that a lot of people are really starting to take notice on Bailey Horn. I won't ask you too much about him, but someone I do want to ask you about that, I'm going to give you the opportunity to gush about him a little bit is Max Bain, who we will likely see in the Tennessee Ooh. rotation or sorry, the Tennessee bullpen. I'd imagine um, Max Bain is, is that guy. I mean, he, I, I think he's a fan favorite of everybody's, whether you follow prospects really closely or not, whether you're a broadcaster, whether you're me, whether you're a, a teammate of his, everyone seems to love Max Bain. And I think he's really onto something in this kind of transition full time into the bullpen. I'm excited to see what Bain can do um, in that Tennessee bullpen. I love Max Bain. And like you said, the opportunity to gush about him, I'll do that seven days a week. When I first saw him pitch, because he was another guy where it's kind of rare you meet him and then you see him pitch. That, that's only happened a couple of times. It happened with Baino, that happened with Ben Brown, and 
maybe one other guy where like I, I had gotten to know the person before I got to know the pitcher from a broadcast booth angle. But the, the first time you meet Max Bain, he not only makes you feel like you're in per- important, he takes, whether he knows you or not, he's going to take an interest in your life. And I really respect people who are like that because they will put others before self, which not only makes Max Bain an amazing person, it makes him an amazing teammate. And I know everybody in a clubhouse has the full support of him and in turn, everybody, everybody loves it. So, you know, when, when he makes a transition like that, and I know there were probably some ups and downs when it came to being a starter. And I know he had a couple stints on the development list, which is not easy, but you, you wouldn't guess it. I mean, the guy, the guy just walked up to you with a smile, whether things were going good or whether things were going not so good. And I, I respect any baseball player, or really anybody in life, Greg, that could be like that. But him as a reliever, all six foot five of him, kind of emptying the tank in one inning of work, heads up because the way he can use his body to excel in what he brings from a stuff perspective. I mean, as a starter, I mean, this is a clear point. As a starter, you have to keep something in the tank as you go. If Max Bain is a setup guy, a one-inning reliever guy. I, I have not seen him pitch as a reliever in that setting, but I'd love to. I, I'd, I'd love to see what the Max Payne stuff looks like when he's just empty in the tank. And, you know, I was trying to think of a guy when I was preparing for this, of somebody I would compare to, not from a stuff perspective, but just seeing them on the mound as like a one-inning reliever, because you don't see a ton of huge dudes that turn out to be just one-inning relievers. Um, a guy that came to mind, Dylan Batances, the old – Yankees and the now Mets pitcher. I mean, he's massive. And I don't, I think he's got a couple inches on Bano, but Dylan Batances is that type of guy. We're like, this guy's huge. Shouldn't he be a starter? But then you see his relief stuff. Like, well, yeah, I know why he's not a starter. Uh, if Max Bain, if his stuff can translate to the bullpen, no, no reason why he can't just blow the doors off. I'm excited for him. Dude, if, if he can be uh, anything resembling Dylan Batances, I think that he's he's going to put together a pretty damn good career. And I I, I think that I, I refer, I've referenced this show a couple times on on Cubs on Deck here. Uh, I've been listening to the uh, Show and Go podcast with uh, Jack McMullen, but uh, Taylor Davis, former Cubs farmhand Taylor Davis, is a, mm. a co-host of that of mm-hmm. that show. And Taylor really hits home the point every single episode how important it is to be a good teammate. And just that he is kind of, he changed his mindset. He always had that mindset, he said, but even more so throughout his minor league and major league career, where it's so important to have the backs of your teammates because that relationship you have with your teammates, making them better, it kind of reflects back on you. And I think that, that Max and his transition to the bullpen, I have not a doubt in my mind that every catcher that he works with and every other pitcher that he's teammates with will have his back in every single way in that transition. And I think that's a reflection on the type of teammate, the type of person that Max is. Yeah. He's just fabulous, man. And unfortunately it just in life, I mean, you, you just don't run into those types of people all the time. The, the people that take a genuine interest in your life. And, you know, Max taught me a lot. He, you know, even from a player to broadcaster, when I see him in the community with fans, with teammates, with, front office staff and everybody's getting treated the same. I mean, that makes me want to be a better person, you know? And um, I, th- I think if somebody hung with Max Bain for 24 hours, I think they come out the other side as a better person. Yeah. I think, I think you absolutely, absolutely nailed it. All right. Let, let, let's, let's transition. I know we're going going a little bit long here um, and we haven't even gotten into the hitters yet. So let's go ahead and transition into some hitters. <laughs> um, I, I think that the the most natural place to start off a conversation about the hitting prospects in Double A Tennessee is with an outfield that is stupid. It, it is it is loaded um, with with some studs out there. I mean, PCA is going to be the opening day center fielder in Double A Tennessee. Uh, Owen Casey will likely be there after his uh, uh, work with the Canadian national team as a part of the the World Baseball Classic. He'll likely be in right field. Uh, Jordan Wogu will be a part of the team. He might be in left field. And that's not even including a guy like Cole Roeder, friend of the podcast here on Cubs on Deck, Cole Roeder. Um, that's a loaded outfield, dude. I, I, I don't know any other way to put it. I don't know any other way to put it either, brother. I mean, goodness gracious. 
I don't want, I, where, where's the okay? Where's the weak spot? Where is the playing time for your fifth outfielder? <laughs> and uh, how many studs are going to get left in South Bend because there's that log jam at Double A? And I, I think I'll start with the last thing I just said. You know, if Broder, Casey, Wogu, and PCA plus you know one more guy uh, are going to be your Tennessee outfield. That means a guy like Yo Hendrick Pinyango stays in South Bend. That means others are getting left in Myrtle Beach. And you know we've talked a lot about the system and just how it has developed. Yeah, this is another example of this is the blessing and the curse of the system. That it, it, you mentioned this at the top of the show that this is all hypothetical, but a, a guy like Yo Hendrick Pinyango. If he sticks in South Bend, I'm sure the Cubs would love to get him ABs at Double A. But at the same time, how helpful will it be to a 20 year old Joe Hendrick Pinyango that he gets another crack at high A pitching when, for a good majority of last year, he was dominating it and kind of ran into trouble towards the end of the year? Maybe it was because he ran out of gas. Maybe it was something else. But you know, the first half numbers for Pinyango were definitely stood stronger than the second half numbers. But back to the guys you talked about. I mean, we're really going to find out quickly, Greg, what kind of guy PCA is. And that, that may sound like a kind of a stupid point, but I, I think because everybody kind of knows what PCA is going to be. But what I mean by that is just how quick is possible here. You know, what do we want to do with them? Because... We've seen prospects and other organizations rushed up and it doesn't go well. And then you're kind of flipping on your thumbs and you're like, well, what do we do now? I think Spencer Torkelson has been a good example in Detroit that, you know, they really rushed him through, brought him up, and it really hasn't been great. But, you know, PCA is 20. So let's say, for example, first half of the Southern League season, PCA hits 270. And he's got an on-base percentage of 350, 360. I mean, that, that's, that's pretty good work w with gold glove defense. And you're like, okay, well, he is adapting to double-A pitching. He's still 20. We have no room for him, at least at the time of triple-A, because Canario, it sounds like he's ahead of schedule. What do we do? <laughs> do you just let it ride? I mean, that, that, that is such an intriguing question, Greg. And I, I just don't know. I can't answer it. It's just exciting. I mean, I, 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 we talked about the World Series earlier. Greg, to me, this is the difference. That in 2013, 2014, you had the studs coming up. You had KB and Javi and Schwarber and Elmora and others. So, Addison Russell. Okay, there, there was those five, six guys coming up. But beyond those five, six guys, you were like, there was a bit of mystery of what else the system could be. Just a little bit. Where you, you can't directly point to a guy and be like, you know what? I think he's really going to help us in 2016. He just didn't have that. Now, mm -hmm. you, you look at PCA and Casey and Wogu, and Canario, and Andy Weber, and Chase Strumpf, and Matt Mervis. Uh, those are eight, nine, ten names right there. But then you, you kind of alluded to this earlier, too. You look around the rest of the system, and you haven't even mentioned names like Pinango and Verdugo, and Alcantara, and Triantos, and Aliendo. And you're like, how many guys are we going to say here that could actually be major league studs? Because Greg, and I, I, this is with no bias at all. I try and keep as much bias out of my play-by-play -play as I can. I, I feel like I've tried to make that clear. I, I, there are, Greg, 25 to 30 guys in this system right now that I think could go to the big leagues in a, in a short yeah. amount of time and have success. And, and that's, to me, that's just the difference from now to 10 or so years ago. I, I think that the best way to even explain that is by looking at one specific player that is going to be manning the outfield in double A this year. And that's Jordan Wogu, right? Because when I look at Jordan yeah. Wogu, 
I look at where he would potentially be ranked on those teams, on, on in those systems back in 2015 through 2019, 2020. And I, what I see is something very similar to Billy McKinney. And, like, they're different players, Ooh. obviously. I mean, they're, they're both outfielders. But they're, they're guys that I think have that type of, like, clout, I guess – where if you stick Jordan Wogu in Billy McKinney's era in the Cubs system, I think that he would be ranked right around the same place, right? And back in those, the the, the top systems, Billy, Mc, Billy McKinney came over and he was like just outside the top 10 or so. I have to go back and look at the numbers for sure. So all of you guys out there listening can can correct me and say, I'm an idiot, I'm wrong. But I, I envision, I, I, I remember Billy McKinney being right around like ranked 10th in the system or so. And then once all those guys came up or the other guys were traded out, Billy McKinney became like a top five guy in the system all of a sudden. And that's where I picture Jordan Wogu. But with Jordan Wogu is now he's like a 30 a, a guy ranked between like 20 and 40, somewhere in that range. And like that's what really mm-hmm. excites me about this system as a whole. But I mean, especially looking at Jordan Wogu, I guess. Man, like again, <laughs> that that's what's so exciting, Greg, that, you can bring up four five, six guys and then be like, okay, those are all great dudes, but how about A, B, C, D, and E? And you're like, yeah. okay, those are all, those are all good players, but how about, how, you know, how about the rest of these guys? So yeah. the, the, the level of just depth and talent, I mean, when you, when you give up your franchise cornerstone major league players, you're supposed to get something back big. But Mm -hmm. I don't think people realize enough, maybe still, and it's probably because Alcantara is still at single A and PCA is just about to crack double A. But from a national perspective, people are starting to realize just how good the Cubs did in all those trades. And it's refreshing because guys like you, guys like the broadcasters in the system, guys like people that actually cover the organization as just opposed to the major league team, realize, realized all along just what they got. But when you deal with national stuff, it's really a what have you done for me lately type thing. And mm-hmm. minor leaguers just don't move the needle. But you're starting to see it change where Morrell makes his debut and Brandon Hughes makes his debut and Jared Young gets up to the big leagues last year and Brennan Davis is just about ready to go and Matt Mervis is just about ready to go. And you're starting to see the tip of the iceberg, but a lot of times, more often than not, that iceberg is pretty deep and it's going and going and going. And that's the Cubs org right now. Yeah, I, I want to hit on on uh, three more kind of quick hits here. The first of which is a position, not necessarily a player. The other two are going to be players. But um, okay. a position okay. that could be really interesting in Tennessee, and you, you've you got a good glimpse of all, of the, all, all three of these guys at the catcher position. Um, we're likely going to see a trio of Pablo Aliendo, uh, Casey Opitz, and Bryce Windham probably back in AA uh, Tennessee again. That's assuming Miguel Amaya is up in uh, up in AAA Iowa. We did see him get right. uh, option from from big league camp today. Uh, technically, the 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 option was down to AA, but that doesn't really mean anything. We could still see Miguel Amaya in AAA, and we covered him on last week's episode. So uh, that trio of Aliendo and Opitz um, and Bryce Windham, I think, is the like the prime example, the the definition of what the Cubs are doing organizationally and including up at the big leagues at the catcher, catcher position, right? Moving on from Wilson Contreras, you got a combination of Jan Gomes and Tucker Barnhart behind the plate. Those are two game manager type catchers. In double A, you got Aliendo, Opitz, and Wyndham, three tremendous athletes back behind the plate and tremendous at calling a game. And I, it just, it's a super intriguing concept to me to see those three guys behind the plate, I guess. Yeah, and you know, to be honest with you, Greg, I really have not seen any of Bryce Windham, but I saw a whole lot of Casey Opus. I saw a whole lot of Pablo Orlando last year, and yeah, the the way that Pablo's game grew, I, I think he just matured 
more than anything because you know being 21 he began to really utilize what was a strength of his as he gets older and that's just his continuing size he got bigger as the year went along last year credit the cubs strength and conditioning staff for doing that because it's really hard and we saw this with him at miguel amaya in 2018 you know miggy he he ended up having to catch 100 plus games and by september he was gassed well pablo was able to split duties last year with Caleb Knight and Casey Opitz. And when he wasn't catching, he was in the gym. He was eating like a horse. And, you know, um, when he was catching, he used that size to his advantage. I think his blocking got better as the year went along. I thought his game calling got better. Um, he had a chance to catch a couple rehab outings, which was exciting for him. He caught Wade Miley a couple times. He caught Drew Smiley. So, you know, again, I, I don't mean to bring up Amaya again, but, you know, when Miggy got to catch you Darvish for the first time in 2018, that, that was his turn back moment to me. That, that was really the moment where he matured more than any time I'd seen him. And then he caught you Darvish for the second time. You're like, oh, my God, like this kid's good. With Ali Endo, he caught Wade Miley twice, caught Drew Smiley, and he looked as comfortable as hell back there. And then his, the power came along, too. He hit that walk-off home run that I mentioned as Peoria. And he, he's kind of he's that locker room guy, too. Uh, I, I, for some reason, the catchers really were the morale boost of last year's team. Him, Nider, and Opie all were just <laughs> – they were just a vibe, man. I loved them all. But, you know, to transition to Casey Opitz, I, I think he's a weapon just waiting to bloom. And uh, a switch hitter, he's got power from both sides. I mean, hell – Greg, he had a game last year at South Bend named after him. We had the Casey Opitz game last year in South Bend uh, <laughs> in a game against the Beloit Skycar, uh, and which, ironically, he was playing first base. He wasn't even catching. He had two home runs. He played first base for, like, the first time he said since college. He made a spectacular dig at first for a key out, and then uh, there was that play at the plate um, mm -hmm. that probably went our way on a call, but we'll take it, and then the Beloit manager got tossed. But uh, he had to range in the foul territory. He was running towards the bullpen, made a basket-style catch, turned, and threw a strike home to Pablo, who applied the tag. We get the out. Again, probably a beneficial call leading towards us. But, hey, that's the game. And, you know, and Casey Opitz comes back into the dugout and, you know, is celebrating with his teammates. So, uh, he, you know, he's got the ability to play catcher. And I think he can I, – I really think he can play first base. So, yeah, I love – guy with power – a uh, guy that pitchers really respect, and I, I love Opie. So, uh, you know, road road is just rising from from this point for Casey Opitz. Yeah, that was one of the most electric games I watched all season last year. Was that was that Casey Opitz oh, game? Oh God, uh, so, so much, much, so much fun. fun, man! So much fun. Um, all right, a couple single player questions here. Uh, I, I want you to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about BJ Murray because you 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 got BJ Murray spent oh. half, about half the season or so in Myrtle Beach and then he came up to South Bend there's been there's been more buzz about BJ Murray than you'd imagine there would be for a guy that's probably outside of top 40 prospects in the system uh this offseason he we, we've we've heard uh guys like PCA have gone on podcasts and gone on interviews and, and specifically brought up BJ Murray I think it helps that he's playing in the world baseball classic uh this year um but mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about BJ Murray and what he kind of brings to the table I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but like I love DJ, and he's he's an amazing dude. He's about as lax of a guy as I've come across. He's somebody that just goes about his business, and he's a great teammate, but he's really hard to fluster. I think there was only one time last year where I vividly remember him complaining about a call, and I remember saying this on the broadcast. I was like, you know, if, if BJ Murray's looking at you as an umpire and disagreeing about a strike three call, no offense to the umpire, but BJ is probably right <laughs> because he's he's got the best eye in the system, Greg. He's got the yeah. best eye in the system. It, it is it is as keen as you get. I mean, either he wears like super brand contacts, or the guy can just read the laces of a baseball better than anybody I've seen. I, I he's got in my pro career of calling games that was the best eye I've ever seen, and it, it's like. I think what makes him so good at the plate 
especially in working counts, is that a lot of guys panic when they go down 0-2, and you may not see them vividly, or I should say, like, visually panicking about no two count, but you can definitely tell if they swing and miss at strike three when a guy's mm-hmm. down 0-2. You know, if they, if they take a half-hearted swing on 0-2 and strike out, you're like, all right. Like, I mean, that guy was just not comfortable the entire A-B. Never in my life have I seen B.J. Murray do that. He went down 0-2, you know, equally as amount of times as anybody. But he worked a number of walks from those situations where didn't panic, maybe had to foul off a couple pitches, but he waited on another strike. And, you know, at the single A level, pitchers a bit more inconsistent. They may not give you another strike when they get down, when they get ahead 0-2. As wild as that is to say, you know, they, they just try and bury it. They try and get you to chase. Um, and for BJ, again, it was just a no panic attitude. And um, I, I love him. He's a great dude. BJ Murray's demeanor and mindset in the box matches his demeanor and mindset outside of the box and out off the field, which is kind of cool. I I think the P, uh, PCA is another guy that matches it in a completely different way, completely different way where their demeanor matches their off the field matches the demeanor on the field. Um, last question I got for you and we'll wrap up here. Um, simply put, can Luis Verdugo play shortstop uh, up at double uh, a Tennessee this year? I think he was incredible on defense at third base in South Bend the entirety of the year. Uh, you think he can handle shortstop in Tennessee? Yeah, I don't know because like he's only going to continue getting taller and bigger. So yeah, I love him at third base personally, Greg. I, I think he's a terrific third base. He's got as about as gl- good as a glove as we've seen pass through South Bend. I mean, not much was getting past the hot corner last year, and um, with with Verdugo, man, like it, it's like. So something in the month of May just clicked because he was hitting somewhere around the Mendoza line for most of April. And then he just went on a run where his average went from basically 200 to 310 in May. And that's mm-hmm. not easy to do. Kind of the same thing as Owen Casey because OC struggled and then hit like 320 in May and then and got his mojo back. Same thing happened to Verdugo. And I actually thought Verdugo got Hosed a couple, not hosed, that's not the right word. I thought Verdugo got the short end of the stick a couple times on Player of the Month awards. I thought he deserved it twice. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, you know, there's a yeah. lot of guys in the organization that deserve it. But um, can he play shortstop? Probably. But I love him at third base. I really do. And, he, again, he's only going to get taller. He's only going to get lengthier. And, you know, that should bode pretty well at third base in my mind. Yeah, I think that if the if the bat continues to, de- to develop in the way that we expect his body to, I think that could be a, a dream combination in terms of what he can do at the plate and what he can do defensively over at third base. So that's that's super exciting. All right, man, I'm gonna I'm gonna kick it to you. Uh, is there anybody else as we wrap up here that uh, you know that you're gonna get to see early on in the season in South Bend that uh, Tennessee Smokies fans should be excited about seeing maybe in the second half of the season this year in 2023. Wow. You know, I would say B.J. Murray, but we just talked about him, so I'll give you somebody else. I, th- I think Porter Hodge. You know, if Porter can find success is what you think he would come back to South Bend to start the year, uh, he, he could kind of repeat himself from a year ago where in Myrtle Beach he shoved and, you know, gets a pitcher of the month award and then comes to South Bend was a key component of that championship run. So, you know, Porter, he's mo- not only monstrous, uh, I think he's got a good command of the zone. He mixes pitches well, and he just – he's got the feel of a big leaguer, doesn't he? Like, when you look at him, you mm-hmm. just – you're just like, okay, that guy looks different from the rest of you. And, <laughs> you know, sometimes visual, uh, you know, it plays a part. But, man, uh, he could pitch, and I'm really excited for his future, especially if he starts on the right track at South Bend this year. In addition to being really good at baseball, Porter Hodge is on the all uh, get off the bus team, uh, just looking like a like a stud as he as he enters the, <laughs> yes. the, the field. So, uh, yeah. I, I love that with Porter Hodge. Is there uh, 
as we'll, we'll go ahead and wrap up here. We've been on, on longer than I expected to. I appreciate you coming on, Brendan. Um, I guess you want to plug yourself and, and what you're doing as far as a radio show and uh, anything like that? Yeah, man. I mean, I'm just really excited for this year. I mean, we're going to have a bunch of games on Marquee. I know. I don't know the exact dates that will come up from Marquee at a later time, but uh, I'm just excited to be back on there. And then, you know, got a little bit of time left here in Indy for the offseason uh, with 107.5 The Fan uh, doing the noon to three show pretty often, just kind of, you know, filling in where I can and and uh, doing what I can to to chip in for the crew. But, you know, it's it's I'm I, I'm very appreciative of the South Bend Cubs who not only let me come back here to Indy for the offseason, but also, you know, during the month of May, I get to still cover the Indianapolis 500, which is one of my favorite events ever. Uh, it's so much fun. And, you know, the, the Cubs, they they let me you know skip a couple of games in May to, to go pursue that and and have that side of my career. So I'm thankful for him. And I'm a lucky guy, Greg, uh, really lucky uh, that I get to do this and, and call games in the organization that I love. But, man, you're killing it. I appreciate you. And uh, keep it up, man. You're uh, you're doing some great work with the org and looking forward to seeing you in South Bend. Hope you can stop by. All right, man, I appreciate it. And uh, you, as as is the case with all of the broadcasters in the system, are absolutely terrific. And, honestly, I, I think that that's a big part – a big reason why the Chicago Cubs have such a loyal prospect following fan base, which is not the case for other organizations. Um, I think the reason why this fan base is so diehard and so large is because of the, the work that you got, you guys do on the, in the broadcast booth between the four of you guys, the five of you guys, I guess on the calls. Um, so thank you so much. And uh, we will be sure to get you, get you back on, on the show uh, at some point before the, uh, during the season, I guess. My dude, anytime, shoot me a text. Always happy to jump on, and uh, we'll talk soon, brother. All right, brother. Uh, for you guys out there listening, thank you so much for tuning into this episode. We will be back. Uh, if you missed the Iowa Cubs preview, go back and listen to that episode last week. This is the Tennessee Smokies preview. Coming up soon, we've got Max Toma, uh, Brennan's teammate. He will be doing the South Bend Cubs uh, season preview, and then in a, a couple weeks here, we'll get uh, Sam Weederhaft on the show and he will be delivering the Myrtle Beach Pelicans preview. So thank you guys so much for listening. Be sure to leave a comment, a rating, a review, subscribe, all that good stuff. Thank you guys so much for listening, and we'll be back in your ears in one short week. Thanks, guys.